Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to another eBay research seminar. I'm Jing Ying Wu, a postdoctoral research fellow of the Ethnic Goods Project. Today, we are very glad to invite Dr. Harris Minonas to give us the talk. Dr. Minonas got his PhD degree in political science from Yale University. He was an academy scholar at Harvard University for two years. Now he is an associate professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University. His research interests include nation and the states building, our uh, policies and the political development. He took the politics of nation building, making co nationals, refugees, and the minorities. He won several academic awards and uh, was also translated into Greek. In addition, he has published articles in many top journals, such as Comparative Political Studies, Perspectives on Politics and the Journal of Ethnic and the Mi Migration Studies. So, okay, I would like to hand over to Harris to present his working paper, Nationalist Education and Emigrates Assimilation. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction and thank you for having me. And, um, I, by now, I know quite a few of the people in the program there because uh, we've already connected, but uh, I'm glad to see some old and new friends on the list of participants. So I'm going to um, jump right in so that we have enough time for a discussion. Uh, this is a paper that um, began when I um, read one of um, Vicky's uh, papers um, in particular, the, the one on the backlash um, uh, that some of you may know, uh, which was uh, a paper about how certain policies uh, aiming at, let's say, assimilation, in this case, may, may have a backlash, may backfire. Um, and uh, I reached out to her to combine um, our interests and our you know, expertise in order to um, explore this particular question at hand that we're going to discuss today. Uh, what are the relations? Uh, what's the relationship between education and and um, integration or incorporation of immigrants? So um, this is not surprisingly, uh, you know, reflected in our motivations. Uh, so the first set of motivations are already embedded in how they started in. Uh, in this first uh, discussion we had. Uh, first of all, it's this idea that I mentioned that um, there is a lot of um, anxiety and a lot of um, understandable uh, focus on um, the ability of societies to incorporate immigrants. Um, and this has been studied, as you know, uh, by many people and there are even whole journals uh, that are dedicated in the study of uh, to the study of these type of processes. However, at the same time, um, th there is the the whole literature on nation building that I have been immersed into that focuses on um, the processes through which. Uh, government elites are trying to make the state and the national unit congruent, as Ernest Gilner would put it. And of course, uh, these, these uh, policies also have an impact uh, in the process, but not only in the destination country, but also in the country of origin. And that's kind of what uh, is kind of novel in this approach, in this causal identification strategy we're, we're fo following because we're actually trying to see what's the relationship between um, the type of education, right, you get at the country of origin before you emigrate and how that affects your prospects of integrating or assimilating ultimately into the destination country, um, uh, given that original treatment, educational treatment. 
So uh, as the second bullet point uh, makes clear, we're trying to put together um, a way that we can explore the divergent effects of education um, on uh, immigrant assimilation or integration. So we're combining this literature that a lot of the people on, on this call um, are familiar with, the, the literature on um, uh, the, the impact of mass schooling with national content um, and uh, on durable national identities on the one hand, but then on the other hand, uh, a vast literature on uh, the, the effects of education more broadly that focuses on how education has been used or educational systems have been used as socialization devices, as um, um, ways to spread social norms or to uh, bring about or to solidify the authority of the state or entrench the authority of the state and so on and so forth. So um, ultimately that would lead to um, more governable um, individuals as Foucault and others would put it. So these two literatures are parallel, of course, and they, they, they speak to the similar um, uh, phenomena, but they haven't been um, put uh, together in dialogue in, uh, in the way we have, I think, before. So ultimately, the motivation building on the theoretical um, literatures I just alluded to and we, you know, Matthias has also contributed to the first um, bucket of of, uh, of the research, and we, we cite him, uh, I believe, in the paper. And if we're not, we, we should, um, but I think we do. Um, the the motivation beyond that those two bodies of literature is to systematically, statistically, um, distinguish these two different functions that have developed also differently in the literature for understandable reasons because they're they're focusing on different aspects of education and look at um what is this uh, function of education in each case so what's the function of education when it produces more human or civic capital and what's its function when it's creating durable national identities and how can we maybe disentangle those uh different effects um in this paper. So the research question that um, by now everybody has uh, probably uh, figured out is what is the role of education in the country of origin for immigrants incorporation in their final destinations, right? So the argument in brief uh, is that we expect immigrants exposed to schooling in their country of origin to display higher civic integration in the destination country. But those immigrants that have been schooled with national content as well, not just general education, should be less likely to culturally assimilate in the receiving country. So we distinguish, in other words, um, between uh, what we would call civic integration, which we try to capture through citizenship acquisition uh, from cultural assimilation or national integration, let's say, um, which involves in our understanding of something of uh, related to identity change. Um, so these two processes are um, uh, also in the literature discussed differently, as you can see in the, you know, few citations we've added here, but we're also thinking that um, um, the function of education could be explaining, different functions of education could be explaining the different outcomes. So we examine, as I said in this paper, the effects of education in the country of origin on civic integration and cultural assimilation. And thus, uh, in this way, we're putting in dialogue these two literatures and Beyond this theoretical contribution, we're trying to test uh, afterwards this argument in uh, a very uh, data-rich environment, um, the, that of the period of the Americanization movement. That's a period that, as all of you know, um, because you read the paper, I'm sure, uh, it's an age of uh, mass migration that has several parallels to today, 
but as I alluded to already, it has rich individual level data that includes uh, many proxies, many um, um, indicators that we can use to approximate civic integration and cultural assimilation in the US context. Um, the research design uh, thus uh, is structured um, in the following way. We test the hypothesis that I, I described in the context of uh, this European primarily migration. There obviously there were also non-Europeans uh, who arrived in the US at that time, but we decided to focus for a variety of reasons we can discuss later focus on the European uh, migration wave. So we're focusing on the uh, immigrants coming to the US from European countries in the uh, late 19th, uh, early 20th century. And um, that's a period where there are at least uh, 24 million uh, immigrants uh, coming from very different educational systems, which allows for great variation in our independent variable of interest, which is the type of education uh, that these immigrants have been exposed to. The US had a rather crystallized constitutive story at the time. Uh, maybe we could add, unlike today, uh, uh, the, that culminated to the Wilsonian Americanization movement that is very well documented. Again, it's a time uh, in the trajectory, trajectory of the United States um, constitutive story development that we can say there is a lot more um, um, similarities between many European societies and other non-European societies today with um, uh, with what America or the American constitutive story uh, was like back then. So in that sense, there is um, extra reasons to choose this case, I believe. Uh, while it would have been much harder to do such a study in, um, in a country that has a heavily contested constitutive story um, at the time of study. We, we exploit um, here the staggered introduction of compulsory mass schooling and then um, compulsory mass schooling with national content across European countries. And uh, also we are uh, exploiting, statistically I mean, uh, the differential timing of immigrants arrival to the US. And that gives us variation both within countries, uh, within country of origin and across countries, um, of course. And that allows us to ex examine how exactly education, the two different functions we were talking about, affects various aspects of integration. And in particular, citizenship acquisition, exogamy, how likely are you to marry outside of um, your group, um, and naming patterns uh, for immigrants' uh, children, first names, uh, first name selections. Um, and then, because we don't want to keep this at the cross-national level alone, we want to make sure that this dynamic uh, travels, we also try to see to what extent this uh, travels at the sub-country level or sub-national, within country level, let's say, uh, in Imperial Germany. So we look at uh, basically, uh, as I will talk about it in a minute, a pattern uh, between Prussian uh, areas of Imperial Germany versus non-Prussian areas. Uh, with uh, And that's primarily because Prussia introduced national content earlier um, than, um, than other areas, at least in a systematic manner. So, um, we can talk about the data more in, in depth uh, at the Q&A, but um, we built on a data set that many, many of you may know. It's a famous paper, I think by now, by Bandiera et al. Um, that um, basically looks at the timing of introduction of compulsory schooling laws across Europe. Uh, she had encoded that paper. They had encoded um, all of the countries we have in our sample, so we had to do some extra coding. And then, of course, we had to extend the data set um, in a way that would um, code uh, the national content in the curriculum that um, didn't really exist. Um, I mean, there are many great case studies of countries uh, which we build on, but there wasn't any data set um, trying to code the existence of national content or national practices um, uh, in its educational system and when did that emerge. Um, and um, so, and over time coding of that, so we did that. 
with the with the help of um, uh, some students, but also uh, now we're in the process, actually, I should say, uh, of doing the expert coding part that uh, some of you and I discussed as a practice uh, recently. It's an arduous and labor-intensive practice, but uh, we're, we're slowly going through it. Uh, just in order to produce an appendix that anyone can use then um, to, um, to have that variable in general available out there, so beyond our paper. And then we uh, also use this re really rich data from the U.S. Census to code some of these uh, individual level um, outcome uh, variables, the dependent variables of interest. And um, uh, we focus primarily in the first 20 years of the 20th century um, to, to capture some of these um, dependent variable uh, variation. Uh, so this brings us to the empirical strategy used in the paper. It's, um, it's very straightforward. Uh, we compare the outcomes of, uh, uh, of immigrants exposed to mass cooling in the country of origin, which is the first equation, uh, to the outcomes of those that were exposed to mass cooling, compulsory mass cooling, but also with uh, national content. Um, so the first uh, equation kind of uh, compares people who haven't been exposed to schooling with people that have. And the second one is expose, uh, um, capturing people who have been exposed to schooling without national content versus the ones that have been exposed to schooling with ma national content. So we're trying in that sense to capture these um, two functions of education we're talking about and the differential impact they may have. Now, as you can see, we include a lot of um, um, uh, controls, let's say, fixed effects for a lot of things. So a lot of the answers uh, to a lot of questions of things that may vary um, can be answered through, well, we've kind of controlled for that to the extent that we could. But I, I invite you um, to, to suggest more ways that we can um, improve this causal identification strategy. Uh, let's go uh, um, to some findings now. Um, if when you look at uh, this first figure, this is a figure that is um, just focusing. It's the first equation. It's uh, comparing people who had no schooling with people that had exposure to compulsory schooling, and you can see that uh, we find a, a pretty strong effect of having been schooled on the top. Um, those are the two dependent variables that are trying to capture civic integration. Wh whether you apply for, how soon did you apply for first papers, which is the first step to get uh, naturalization, uh, to get naturalized. And the, the top one is about um, uh, actually getting naturalized. So we find a really strong effect, positive effect of having been schooled or having coming from a country that has introduced compulsory schooling um, and uh, applying for first papers. Uh, as you can see, there is no um, statistically significant, at least, effect um, of uh, just compulsory schooling or exposure to education in general on um, what we would call the cultural assimilation variables, uh, endogamy and uh, first names, which are represented at the top, uh, at the bottom um, side of this graph. Now, when we look at um, when we look at the effects, when we look at the effects of national schooling, oops. Um, when we look at the effects of national schooling, so, and by nationalist, maybe it's a misnomer, we mean schooling with national content. Um, in today's world, maybe national schooling may mean something more um, than that. So I want to clarify that. So when we look at um, uh, national schooling, and it doesn't have to be nationalist in today's um, uh, way of talking about this term. So it just means that um, uh, there is a, uh, a very clear attempt by the government uh, uh, that introduces this or, or you know, regulates this um, schooling system to impart um, feelings of pride or strong attachment to a particular constituted story, then we see a different picture. 
we see um, that uh, the cultural assimilation uh, dependent variables uh, become significant and they are positive. So in other words, endogamy is um, statistically, positively statistically correlated. Uh, in other words, it's more likely uh, when someone has been exposed to a uh, mass cooling with national content. And similarly, you're more likely to keep ethnic names um, uh, in your family if you have uh, been exposed to mass cooling with national content. And again, these are predictions that are consistent with uh, Keith Darden's um, first mover advantage uh, story and extended with, by liable cells in the case of Catalonia that many of you may have seen that article because it's it's related to, um, to Catalan uh, nationalism. Um, since I'm giving a talk uh, in Barcelona, even virtually, I should uh, mention this. Um, and uh, we, we cite this work, of course, as, uh, as uh, inspiration for this uh, hypothesis. On the other hand, we do find that um, uh, there is less, um, uh, there's more of a negative effect on uh, the likelihood uh, that someone gets naturalized. And we interpret this finding, again, consistent with these theories, we believe, in the sense that, first of all, um, if you have a durable national identity, it may be harder for you uh, and may, or it may take longer for you to, uh, to actually uh, go all the way to naturalization while you may be willing to apply for first papers, which gives you some legal... Um, uh, gives you a legal standing of sorts in the country, you may not want to go all the way for a variety of reasons. One could be, uh, we interpret this as being uh, a result also of um, um, dual citizenship not being allowed uh, with many uh, in, in many cases. So you would need to denounce your original citizenship, which for someone who has a durable national loyalty um, uh, produced through schooling, uh, that may be... Um, a bigger cost than than for others. Moving on to the promised uh, subnational variation, um, uh, the the within country variation in Germany. Here, the design is more um, um, specific and and quite I think straightforward in the sense that um, Prussia is known for having introduced compulsory schooling early on, and then. Uh, it introduces um, national content right after uh, Imperial Germany uh, is um, is created, and I would say even earlier than 1872. Uh, other German regions, though, um, have not um, followed suit as quickly. Uh, it doesn't mean they didn't have um, uh, national content, but it wasn't the same kind of uh, national content and we know that for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons we know it is because Kaiser Wilhelm II was really upset about it uh, and complained uh, to his um, to his uh, subordinates and um, introduced new reforms. Uh, they, they ended up introducing new reforms at the end of uh, the 1880s, implemented by the early 1890s in other parts of Germany in order to actually expose everybody to the same type of national content. Um, so we're trying to, again, statistically exploit this variation to see whether there is a discernible effect even within this country variation, uh, because we do know whether people are coming from Prussian areas versus non-Prussian areas of Germany when they come to the US, right? So we, what you see here is um, the result are the results of uh, Prussia versus the rest kind of thing, right? So um, the idea here, uh, or what you see here is that um, those who have been schooled with national content earlier are much more likely, for example, to keep ethnic names than those who are coming from other parts of Germany. Uh, that have not introduced um, national content uh, as early. Um, and they're also, though, more likely to go for first papers, but not for naturalization, which, again, we interpret the similar way we interpreted in the previous graph, uh, that um, when you have a strong national identity, maybe you're hesitating to go all the way to full naturalization. Um, so 
So these, in other words, this is another way of saying these seem consistent with the results I showed you at the cross-country um, analysis. And, and that gives us uh, extra um, uh, confidence, I think. Um, so to conclude, I don't want to take too much time. Um, I already spoke for quite a bit. Um, I think our setup um, allows us to disentangle these two functions of schooling to the extent possible, the, what we call the civic capital transmission and um, versus the national identity formation um, function. We find that these effects um, go in different directions. Um, in particular, um, if we combine the results of both analysis, we can conclude that national schooling has an unambiguous effect on the cultural assimilation variables. Um, however, the effects on civic integration are a bit more mixed, uh, but um, the, the interpretations that, uh, there are interpretations that I gave, I think, uh, that uh, could make, help us make sense um, of these patterns, even the civic integration within the framework of um, our argument. Finally, for policy implications, um, we're thinking that today, given that how widespread the application of compulsory schooling has become globally, and the introduction of national content has also um, become much more standard than it was in the 19th century, migrants today, as a result, are by and large schooled, right? Um, and more often than not, they're schooled with national content. So they're more likely to become civically integrated based on these findings of this paper, but may resist cultural assimilation. So from that, we are uh, proposing or we're suggesting that the implication of our paper is that um, uh, given that civic integration is a more basic prerequisite for social cohesion, at least in liberal states, governing elites in the, in the Western world, at least, uh, or in liberal states, I should say, uh, should not um, promote ethnocultural elements as parts of their constitutive stories, especially when it comes to the integration of immigrants, but rather um, should um, use uh, more civic criteria for the membership of newcomers. And that would uh, facilitate uh, the integration um, of those immigrants. So, so again, uh, that builds and comes back to some of my work on constitutive stories and the the varieties of different forms of nationalism. So there is there, there are ways to use these findings um, to make um, you know to make this process smoother. So uh, with that, I can stop sharing or I can leave the slides up. I can pass the baton back to Chunying. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now uh, we move on to the Q&A time. And uh, before that, I want to exert the power of being a chair to be the first one to give some feedback. Okay. Um, I really enjoy reading this uh, paper. I think, yeah, it is really an interesting and a very good paper. You trace back your uh, argument and your data back to 100 years ago. I have two comments which are, I think, a suggestion more than question. The first one is regarding the causal mechanism of your first hypothesis. It seems to me that there are two factors involved in civic integration. First one is your willingness to be a U.S. citizen. That is uh, education in uh, because education taught six cultures, right? And uh, the second one is your ability to apply for citizenship. That means educated people could better handle bureaucracy and those tedious paperwork. Um, here, uh, for me, I think civic uh, values are a very broad concept and are highly associated with your civic responsibilities to like, make your neighborhood, your community, and your country better. 
So if you learn the civic values in your mother country, then I doubt that it may help enhance your willingness to naturalize as a U.S. citizen. You know, uh, in the figure two, you also point out that people who accept nationalist education actually is their willingness to uh, apply for citizenship, right? In addition, I know some Asian Americans who have been a permanent residents for more than 10 years, but haven't applied for citizenship. I asked them why. They told me that's because the only difference between a permanent resident and a citizen in the U.S. is whether or not you can vote and can be a candidate. Because they are not interested in politics, so they have no incentive to naturalize. So I think if you can cite some literatures on the uh, relationship between education and uh, the willingness to participate in politics or in elections, I think that can make your you know, causal mechanism more complete or more better than emphasize civic you such a broad concept. The second one is regarding the cultural um, assimilation, the control variable. I'm thinking whether it is also related with the neighborhood those immigrants were living in. For example, you know there are many immigrant towns or villages in the United States. Today there are still eight uh, in Ricksburg in the U.S. You know, one of them is near Austin, Texas, and I have been there twice. Uh, by the way, I highly recommend the German sausage there. So 100 years ago, you know, residents in those German communities still hold a very strong German identifications. And I guess that even if you did not accept nationalist education, you were still highly likely to marry a German and uh, gave your children a German sound first name, I think, yeah, you may try to control the neighborhood living because I think this information is also, should also be provided in the uh, uh, data, right? Yeah, this is my uh, yeah, Excellent, suggestion. thank you so much. Yeah, um, I'm one of these people who, uh, uh, did not have, I'm, I'm in the U.S. for 21 years now and I'm not a citizen, so I, I, I know the mechanisms you're talking about. Um, although I am, I have applied for citizenship this year, so maybe something changed because of the paper. I'm endogenous to this study. <laughs> um, but um, no, be, besides the joke, um, although it's true, I have been here for 21 years without being a citizen. Um, the the point you're making about distinguish between if i understand it correctly between civic integration mechanism the mechanism being an, a, a one of capacity in other words to navigate bureaucracy which is one of the mechanisms we're implying you're right um and versus the mechanism working through values i think that's an important point and we've been thinking about how we can um there are different ways you can we can check for this. Uh, one would be to go down the road of trying to see restrict the sample of countries um, to the countries we think have very similar values to the U.S. at the time, and then try to see if the, there is a difference of results. So we have thought about that. We haven't done it though. So the fact that you are pointing to that means that we should do it and report on it. Um, and um, at the very least, we can at least write, uh, add more things about our uh, expectations from the literature, how education leads to more political involvement, as you said, right? And you would think that um, that would be a better mechanism to spell out um, because then education then is more clearly linked um, or education without national content in general education leads to more politically active citizen or, or subjects let's say if they're not citizens denizens 
uh, which means that they would want to be naturalized in order to have voting rights, right? That's your mechanism. Yeah. That's the mechanism you're suggesting we should add. Yeah. So we, yes. we can definitely beef up that, although I do think that still it doesn't get to the values point. It's a it's an extra. I think we can add that and still have the values problem. So we, we need to tackle. I think I would say your first point is two points the way you said it, I, I believe. Right. And, and they're <laughs> both good points. Um, yeah. So we will we'll, we'll try to address this. Um, going to cultural assimilation, this is, uh, I think you're suggesting a mechanism that is more like ethnic enclaves mechanism, right? Um, Greeks go to Astoria, they don't have to integrate because, you know, in New York, Astoria, you can speak Greek and probably all your life and, um, you know, maybe it wouldn't be a problem, right? So you don't have to, um, uh, make an effort to assimilate, you would say. Um, so that is, um... First of all, in the case of the subnational or the, the within country case, that would have, first of all, it would have to do with, um, for those findings to be the way they are, it would need to be that Prussians are operating differently than non-Prussian Germans, right? So it would mean that um, Bavarians are, are not very much into living with other Bavarians, but Prussians are, right? So there would need to be more reasons, first of all, for us to worry about that. But I see your point. One thing we could do is we could add county or state, well, probably county fixed effects. Um, uh, so that would be a statistical way of fixing. It still wouldn't fix necessarily uh, it would control for some of these effects, but it wouldn't uh, fully. Another way would be if we um, um, look at the timing of the first emigration of any group, right? So mm -hmm. a second way I can think of would be to make sure that there are no prior enclaves for a group, right? Because the good thing is that uh, uh, for many of these groups, um, they their first um and mass arrival to the u.s happens around the first time we are coding this right it's not that there are many pre-existing enclaves for people to go into right uh germany is an exception of that sir so we would need to do a different type of fix for germans because um uh even before imperial germany existed there were obviously uh people who spoke german uh dialects mm. because there was no imperial germany who were either from prussia or from bavaria or whatever before it wasn't before it was one country uh that had emigrated and there were some uh obviously settling you know communities settled before so uh, so the timing of immigration can be maybe um in the cross country uh side of things could be um helpful to uh so restricting the time sample we look at, we can uh, reduce the likelihood that this mechanism is what's going on, right? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but yes. those are technical fix. There, there is very little other way we could, um, you know, uh, do that. You know, obviously because this is a historical study, we can't really, you know, do, do um, ethnography on that front. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, welcome to raise your hand. Uh, Bur Wow. Uh, hey, Burke. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for this very interesting paper. And I have to admit, I had didn't have a chance to read it. I was in a PhD workshop uh, here at uh, UPF University, and I was reading three other papers, and sorry, I did not get to yours. So maybe I my question understand. is addressed in the paper, but you mentioned that you control for uh, age at immigration, that you just control for that. I was wondering whether you uh, could also look for interaction effects or heterogeneous effects, uh, assuming that at some point, I mean, it would be interesting to know at what age uh, when somebody arrives into the uh, into the U.S. in this case, uh, at what point then the uh, education they receive in the U.S. then starts to overlay these effects of the education in the home country? So I think this would also have obvious uh, practical and policy implications. My second question was whether the conceptually whether the I mean what what your variable of nationalist education in the origin country really captures. 
And I mean, actually, I, I felt there was some, uh, maybe in your own thinking, maybe a bit of ambiguity, ambiguity still uh, on this, because you mentioned that this is not the way we would define nationalist education today, but then what is it, right? Because you seem to assume that the effects would work in a fairly similar way, that it would uh, create these strong national identities. So uh, maybe some more clarification on that. But then also, I would assume that origin countries that go through the effort of providing this type of education may also already have uh, within their societies uh, potentially have a stronger nationalist bias. Um, I mean, this is something to, to be debated, right? I mean, maybe, as you say, uh, the... Uh, Can you repeat elite... the third one? Can you repeat the third one? Because I was writing the previous one. Uh, no, this, the I'm one still you're at the, just talking. Yeah, I'm, it's still actually part of my second question. <laughs> so <Okay>. whether <laughs> whether the, country, the origin countries that provide nationalist education whether what that really captures, whether uh, the fact that this education is provided uh, also tells you something about the strength of national identities in these societies. So it could be that the uh, identity is already very strong in these societies, and so that there is also a demand for this uh, type of um, education in the origin countries. Or you describe the, uh, the example of the uh, German Kaiser, that there is a sense that uh, this uh, sense of pre-existing national identity is particularly weak and so that then the elites decide to provide this education but then there are these I mean then it's not in both cases it's not entirely clear what this variable of the supply of nationalist education in the origin country captures right because it interacts with societal uh, the strengths of, uh, of uh, national identities in the society right is, is the question clear yeah yeah okay okay but thanks really interesting paper and uh, to, very very to, nice okay. identification strategy thanks thank you so much should i take them one by one? it's going to be difficult to mix them up right Ying? should i answer uh yeah i think because um yeah, because, there because, are because otherwise three... we're gonna we're gonna it's gonna be hard to to keep up because these were these were not uh these were quite um you know, uh, difficult questions in a, in a good way. Very helpful, I mean. Um, so <clears throat> the first one, yes, uh, the first one is empirically um, um, time consuming and difficult, but I, I think we can uh, we can definitely do more on that front, especially given that um, um, the Bandiera et al. paper that I mentioned um, is uh, actually Focusing on exactly the 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 side of things that you your first question is talking about. So the whole idea there is, to what extent the type of immigrants that different states in the United States received in that period, so whether they were educated or not in their paper, whether that uh, how that affected or impacted the U.S. state's educational system, right? So so in a way we do have quite a bit of information as you can imagine on um, the different ways that uh, different states uh, schooling systems in the United States have developed. So we could uh, do more on that side. So you're, you're, you're um, absolutely right. We could uh, look at these heterogeneous effects. The second question is harder primarily because, um, well, first of all, my, my, has it, my, my um, um, pause, over the term nationalist did not have to do with our my uh, worries about our coding, but it was primarily about what the term nationalist has come to mean today. So nationalist is usually used as an accusation almost in today's world. Well, we, we're using it just as a descriptor, right? So maybe we need to rethink about how this would be interpreted today. That's all I meant. So, so it's not about whether it's not about whether schooling or uh, textbooks are more or less uh, sanitized or more or less nationalist today. It's more about how the term is being interpreted in the public sphere today uh, for a variety of reasons that are unrelated to our uh, causal identification strategy. So, uh, but going directly to the second part of the question, which is much closer to uh, um, my worry more theoretically, because the other one is more of a policy um concern i have um or or public perception concern uh the the 
country of origin could be introducing schooling for different reasons you're saying which is co probably correct although most of the cases i know well um have a common uh reason which is not obviously to fight uh, socialism and communism, as Willem II is saying in some of these quotes. Um, but in other cases, it's uh, because they think uh, the country is not cohesive enough. So, so it's, it's usually supply driven, if I understood correctly how you understand supply and demand. It's not that peasants are crying uh, out loud, oh, please nationalize us, makes a, make us uh, Frenchmen from peasants, right? Going back to Eugene Weber's work. So, so, but you are right that there could be different threats. So in other words, the supply side may be the common thread, but uh, you would still, I think, have a point, if I understood your, your point correctly, that there may be heterogeneity in, um, there, there must be heterogeneity, not there may be. There, will, there definitely is heterogeneity of why different governments adopt it at the time they do, the national content part. Um, now, the question, though, is, is this consequential for the subject population that is being educated, right? So how would that affect the, the, our identification strategy? I'm not 100%. Maybe what you're implying, and I, you can follow up, is that if different reasons if different reasons have prompted your national schooling um, uh, adventure the content would also be um, following suit and it would be affected by the reason that prompted it so then maybe we have heterogeneity on what national schooling means which i think again brings us back to what you implied i think in the first question which is to know more about what we mean by national schooling so our our coding um, is quite minimalist, so we wouldn't capture this type of um, reach variation in what way. Our narrative would capture it because we ha we have uh, we're creating an appendix where we go into the narrative where we unpack more in more words how things have played out. But when it comes to the statistical analysis, you can't really capture that uh, easily. So uh, the the, the coding is, is there nationals, nationalist schooling or national content in the curriculum uh, is, um, is a basically a, a binary coding, uh, whether, you know, there is a history book that only focuses on the glorious history of Greece or Romania or, you know, Switzerland, um, that is national content. Now, if in that it says, all um, socialists are the enemies of Kaiser Willem II or not? That we don't capture that, right? Is that so? So you're right. We are. We would be missing any variation that has to do with um, what prompted that nationalist content. But we we are not um, coding that. We're coding whether there is an attempt from the government to inculcate. A national categorization of us versus others um, that crystallizes according to this theoretical framework in a way that then it's really hard to undo. And you would always think of yourself as someone uh, who is Greek or German and so forth. So, so that's what we're trying to capture. But I see there's definitely a variation in the in the other fronts you suggested. Okay. I, I hope uh, that helps uh, clarify some of this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in order to make Harry's colleagues as many comments as possible, oh, sorry, right I'll, now I'll I keep my okay. answer shorter. <laughs> yeah. I still have three hands. So, Emre, and then uh, Foya, and then uh, Matthias. So, please go ahead, Emre. Emre, are you still here? <laughs> Oh, he lowered his hand, I think, now. So we can go to Fulia. OK. Maybe hi. I covered him with, yeah, yeah. Hi, hi. It's great to see you. Um, hi, Fulia. Thank you so much for this super interesting study and the paper. Um, I'm just wondering whether the coding also captures um, language uh, education like um, he, I'm asking this because uh, in a more recent study Juan Diaz Medrano 
uh, looks at the relationship between cosmopolitan identity and uh, binational couples. And one thing that he found, if I remember correctly, is whether you speak English or not actually matters a lot when it comes to European identification. So um, I'm just, you know, inspired by that finding, and I'm wondering whether for the period that you're looking at, whether, um, you know, exposure to English prior to immigration has any impact on uh, the dependent variable that you're looking at. Um, likewise, um, I think it might be also interesting to consider whether the immigrants had any, you know, um, exposure to or additional help for learning the language, I don't know, by church organizations in the destination uh, that they, they arrived in, in the U.S. Um, do you have any data that you could maybe include as controls um, in the models that you're testing um, to, to look at the, the language effects? Thank you. Should we collect more uh, singing because yeah, uh, I think uh, yes. So Matthew well, are we running out of time? I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know how much time we have, but yeah. But but basically, free as is a suggestion. We will definitely look into that. Um, uh, we could statistically, obviously, we can you know um, uh, also run uh, a model without exposure to English. Uh, language, the, uh, countries of origin that have English as a first language and see if these cross-national results hold. Clearly for the Prussians and Bavarians et al, uh, would not, this would not be um, affecting the, the findings. But, but I see your point. Um, uh, so th there is always a statistical answer and the more theoretical answer. I see your theoretical point. Uh, we can definitely acknowledge this and still see whether it affects statistically our findings. Yeah. All right, uh, Matthias, please go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for the wonderful paper. I mean, really, it. Um, yeah, takes, I mean, the the research design is 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 really really interesting, and and you did a great job. And so, I mean, what I'm what I'm adding is more yeah, the icing on the cake. So take it in that spirit. Yeah. So, I mean, my my theoretical concern basically piggybacks on what um, Chun Ying already alluded to. I mean, I would, in my reading of the mass education literature, yeah, you have those who treat schooling as schools as nationalizers. Yeah, that's. Eugen Weber and Darden and Milonas and so on, yeah. And then you have those who treat um, schools as modern value inculcate, yeah, or the diffusion of, of of civic values, yeah. And there's this whole civic education literature, um, yeah, sort of that schools, yeah, turn peasants into, um, yeah, participating political workforce, yeah. yeah. Or, and then, yeah. But then you also have a third literature that's a little bit darker and comes sort of from the Foucauldian angle at schooling, yeah, sort of schools at, at, as discipliners, yeah, there's sort of the, that create like modern subjects like rational cocks in the capitalist machine, yeah, that can sort of have the necessary skill sets, yeah, to push papers, yeah, and to, to, to do various things. So, so I think you're doing, I mean, the first one is clear, yeah, but I think with the second two schools as value disseminators and schools as discipliners, you're kind of mixing, mixing them together in the moment. We are, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. theoretically. And so maybe, I mean, put it very crudely, maybe um, think of a different label or con like root concept than civic integration, because for me, when I hear the word civic integration, I think of the extent to which individuals participate in civil society, are members of bowling leagues, yeah, are not just loyal to their family or tribe. I think of participation in political life and voting. But that's not really what you're getting at. And that's different from, yeah, sort of being disciplined and being able to, yeah, to engage in, in paperwork to handle the bureaucracy. Yeah, in, in, in modern countries. So so maybe differentiate that more. And your your measure really How would you gets, suggest we do that? In I mean the label in I mean when I read through your paper, like civic edu civic integration, in my view, yeah, has this yeah, I would 
I would kind of, in my mind, I would kind of treat them as distinct, yeah, sort of school. So, so what I'm suggesting, uh, what I'm yeah. trying to understand, Matthias, is are you saying that we could go into, so since we're doing anyways the coding of, um, yeah. I'm now putting together the appendix yeah. for the national content and practices, mm -hmm. uh, are you suggesting that we could also, since we're looking at this curricula all over again, that there may be a way to distinguish between um, schooling regimes that are primarily focused on imparting values versus the ones that are more about disciplining? Is that, that could, what you're suggesting? That be, yeah, that could be one option. Or uh -huh. if you want to stick, if you only want to stick for very pragmatically reason to the citizenship yeah. <laughs> position yeah. as your, your measure, then I would frame it more around the disciplinary angle mm -hmm. rather than the, the civic value i got it okay i see i see because so the you, civic you're saying could be too close to the con national content right yeah too close to the national content or too close to something normative yeah that we think of mm -hmm. as civic education and becoming yeah um mm -hmm. i see exactly what you're saying yeah you're right yeah your reviewer so number two yeah. <laughs> No, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm joking. I, we haven't submitted it. I'm saying in general, you would be the one saying, take out this yeah. framing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, no, no, this is very helpful. Yeah. And then I just have some nitpicky stuff. And you don't need to answer because probably maybe Emre has something, something uh, more interesting to say. But one, like, these are more like additional controls or alternative explanations. Yeah. One is, you know, some of European migrants, but not all, have been, the reception of them within U.S. society has varied, yeah? Some of them has been, have been racialized and discriminated against. Others were immediately understood as part of the white majority. And I'm referring here, yeah, to, to the Irish and to the, to the Italians on the one hand, and then the Scots and the Germans on the other hand. So maybe thinking this further so maybe it's not just the schools in the nationalist education in the in the country of origin that leads to yeah a slowed down cultural assimilation process but maybe like this formation of a reactive ethnicity towards um processes of of discrimination and racialization in the u.s yeah the uh, other so do you opposed italians and irish to scots and germans you said yeah i mean I'm so you, it's, you think that scots and germans yeah. have not as much right not as much yeah in germans after world war ii but that was not necessarily that world was more war II. Like, yeah. World war one yeah. yeah yeah after yeah. world war one that was the where their kind of loyalty to the u.s was severely questioned but yeah. before i mean they were kind of in terms of like when you look at the racial racialization yeah, totally. that, I, I understand so your point. Sorry, I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. The other, and that's again nitpicky, but there is a sociology of uh, on names and naming, and what these guys are arguing is is that you have like um, what names you give your kids is primarily it's about differentiating yourself from the last generation, gaining some some cultural capital. So put crudely, so is it really that um, Greeks in, in the US, um, second generation Greeks called Andreas, are called Andreas because their parents were nationalized in Greece, or did it have something to do that the name Andreas might have become fashionable in the US around this time period? Yeah. And, and I'm happy to send you some slides on that. Yeah, that would be great, yeah. yeah. And last but not least, I don't know, in, in the German example, it just, you probably have this in the model already, but I, f I felt like Prussia in that time period you're looking at was more developed and more industrialized than Bavaria and Württemberg, who were rural backwaters. Hard to think of, as they're today the, the economic powerhouses of the country, but at that time they were rather poor. So could this also, yeah, I mean, this, this kind of general background mm -hmm. rather than the kind of schooling regimes might have played a role in how mm -hmm. these 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 groups fared in, in the US. It, it definitely has an impact on something I didn't mention in my presentation, um, but it is in the footnote. 
it definitely played a role in implementation, Matthias, right? Uh, yeah. So, so that we do, uh, we did run the analysis also with a 50% threshold of literacy, uh, which was an attempt to try to capture, you know, you may have compulsory schooling, but have you managed to implement it, mm -hmm. right? And clearly, Prussia has gone way beyond other areas, uh, but also even at the European level, it's much more effective in spreading actually compulsory mass schooling. So it's one thing to introduce it, and it's another thing to achieve it, mm -hmm. right? So we're trying. We we are playing with different thresholds. Thankfully, we have data on literacy levels that are we're using as proxies of implementation. And uh, probably in the next iteration of the paper, we, we will make a section of the paper about distinguishing between law and implementation. Yeah. Thank you. It's great. It's great. Yeah. Maybe hey. Emery can run it now. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Emery, Emery, Emery number has three. Run it in three different ways. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Number, number three. I'm, yeah, I'm, I can connect now. Sorry, I was having some issues with the mic, so I couldn't enable it uh, when it was my turn. Uh, but mm -hmm. Harris, thank you very much for a very interesting paper. It's a nice take on the Bandiera article, I thought, mm -hmm. and kind of uh, really filling that gap, which they identified in the paper too, you know, saying, look, we're not looking at content, so, and uh, the origin uh, of the countries, well, they do in a different way. Um, so I had like two themes of questions. One was uh, kind of things that you've already talked about, kind of the application, especially application in a kind of 19th century setting. Um, so I'm not sure about the German case specifically, but yeah, something gets instituted, but ob obviously Germany was in an advantageous position and had really good literature literacy rates in this period, but problems such as, you know, finding the right teachers, uh, opening schools in rural areas. Uh, so yeah, the fact that, like you said, being... Say it again, because you were breaking for a minute. I don't know if it was just me, but... Okay, yeah. So the first point is about the appli applicability. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I heard law. that point. I heard, the, I heard that okay. point, yeah. Yeah, the second part of that theme is uh, the private, religious, and public schooling divisions. Uh, I'm not sure about Germany, but in Austria, even when public schooling was introduced very early in the 1780s, uh, it was mostly in the hands of religious orders to educate the population. So you can have a public track, but most people still attending religious schools. Actually, it's more advantageous for them because they get to, you know, uh, have education and determine their own curriculum in their own language if there is regional dialects or in their own religion. So, you know, the this this division public schooling. Um, uh, going at uh, something Borge mentioned, which is the interaction with the domestic with the domestic U.S. context. I mean, the Bandiera article also says people who did not have compulsory education were more likely to be targeted by um, the federal authorities, the federal educational authorities, with na national education policies. So it seems that having compulsory education or not in the origin country is related to the later educational trajectories of within the US. So they're not really independent. So uh, maybe that's something to also consider going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually their, their main argument is that uh, it explains that variation ultimately of how people reacted. Yeah, thank you, Emre. Uh, you were breaking, but I think I got the points the implementation problem i completely agree even with the although i do think it's a, 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 a relative fix is this um threshold uh, idea that we're using which is not new obviously uh but we you know that's one way to get to some of the variation implementation across countries but it wouldn't still get to urban rural divides that you have in mind i think with your question uh, which definitely exist. Um, so that that is still a problem because you know if you use a very low threshold like fifty percent, you know it clearly it could be just urban centers, right? So so that that could we might need to also um, 
tinker around with like higher thresholds, like 80% or something like that, which would take, you know, at that time, in, you know, at that time, of course, urbanization is much lower uh, than it is today. So we, we can find a, a way to uh, solve this through that. But the second point you're raising is harder to solve the private religious schooling versus public schooling. It's not a problem in every country, but it's um, but it does come up obviously in um, beyond Austria. It comes really big time in cases like Ireland and uh, cases even like Italy, uh, where there are um, there they become it becomes more of a problem because they may not even operate in the same direction, right? So so that makes it even more problematic. How do you code schooling? um curriculum content in a country where you know private religious schooling goes up the opposite direction than the public schooling content right uh and in some of these cases this is a reason for an all-out kind of battle between religious institutions and the state so so that is harder to so we do go case by case and we try in the country narratives to um explain why we would um code uh, a country in one way or another but when it comes down to the actual indicator going into the statistical analysis uh it's not as nuanced obviously but we we are thinking uh quite intensely about that now in some cases it's less of a problem uh if you think that religious schooling was actually just that just religious right um but it's not always just religious um, because in many cases uh the religious schooling had uh, already been influenced by the age of nationalism and as you said just using the language of uh, of a particular group in the in the the rites and the in the sermons um that was already a political kind of proto-national uh claim in some cases so we, we, I'm, you know, I've thought about that, but um, I can't really capture that nuance in the statistical um, um, coding, but I can in the appendix. Um, the, the third point you raised, um, it is, we, we do uh, build on Bandiera's um, coding, so, and we are aware uh, of her work, um, but we're looking at, um, so depending on how you think education works or how all these efforts by the U.S. works, um, you would um, have different predictions about when would that U.S. treatment start mattering, right? Uh, so there are um, some lagged effects. Um, and um, if you look at people who have already been educated in their country of origin when they arrive, they wouldn't be treated right by the US authorities. The exception is what Fulia raised. I would need to look into whether there were special attempts to teach the language, right? Even to people who are above uh, 18, if you know, if you're following me. So so that that is something that I haven't looked at, the what Fulia raised. But I wouldn't expect someone who is already fully schooled in, in Prussia um in 1890 um to then somehow be influenced by you know the state of texas deciding to change its schooling curriculum uh for uneducated people right so for people who who are uh, so so i'll have to think about with vicky how this would affect our causal identification for what we're doing uh but but definitely i think bandera and Dal, at all have a really strong uh, finding that I don't think it necessarily messes with our finding, but maybe I misunderstood um, what, you, what you were suggesting. Uh, in the long run, of course it will, uh, just to clarify, uh, we're not saying that this, we're not claiming that our finding will last um, for multiple generations. This is primarily focusing on the first couple of, well, the first generation primarily, uh, as an effect, it's not it's not saying much about the overtime variation because, as you're implying, there is a lot of supply side policies from the U.S. side to to change that over time, right? So we're not 
we're not claiming that we're 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 capturing that process yeah thank you for these excellent comments yeah uh, okay is there I have anyone a lot of things here <laughs> and thank you for the clarification again uh uh in the chat yeah if you have more if you don't want to speak or if you can't speak because you have a toddler like i do in my in your home you can write in the chat and i can uh, i can uh, uh take those comments copy paste them so that vicky and i can address them in the next iteration okay uh, is there anyone who uh, want to raise questions if not, I would like to ask, I mean, Emre, especially for the second one, how were you thinking this could be dealt with, the private versus public um, schooling? That's, I think, like going into educational statistics in the origin country. Oh, no, we know, we know, we, we do have such data. The question is, how would you end up actually, how would you call yeah. a country that ha you know italy for example mm -hmm. italy has a constant struggle until mussolini comes to power uh there is um clear contestation between the church and the state and uh there is wide variation in that on that front uh, across the country and only with mussolini there is a fusion between those two in terms of schooling um so how do you actually so when you have a statistic that Italy becomes, you know, um, literate by X time based on census data, how do we know whether the literacy is coming right from the state schools versus the Catholic church schools, right? Um, that, those are the type of issues that I don't know exactly how to um, address. Um, we would probably need to have a... Um, some measure of like the percentage of the population that goes to uh, religious schools over time and and based on that kind of use a cutoff probably, right? And say it's lower than X percentage. The other problem is that some people go on the weekends on those, those schools and on the weekdays in state schools. So what do you do with that, right? That, that That is impossible, I think. But yeah, I think cutoff points, variations between provinces or, no, it's impossible in Italy, Emre, but it is possible. It's it's actually happening in the U.S., for example, <laughs> uh, and it happens in many countries that uh, religion would have, um, you know, catechism or some sorts of uh, schooling type propaganda of their own, right, uh, on on weekends. But um, state would do inculcation or indoctrination on the weekdays, right? So. Uh, we do have, uh, I mean, I can give you a lot of examples. The Greek Orthodox Church definitely has that. <laughs> um, so, so I, how you, how you adjudicate what's going to stick to the individual. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Individual level, I think it's very hard unless you have that, I mean, unless you have that data. But yeah, I think the more logical way seems going by these changing percentages or Mm -hmm. variations within Germany about the concentration of religious schools. I know some people have used uh, for economic history papers kind of the repression of the Catholic Church as this like natural experiment in Germany. Um, some people linking it to far-right voting. Uh, but yeah, those are things that come to mind or, you know, the massive influx after World War II, but this is too far away for you of uh, East European Germans. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the the safest is to look at the changing percentages um, uh, in the appendix, and um, you know hopefully that won't lead to many. Um, uh, it won't lead to changing our actual coding so far, but uh, it may. We don't know. So I would have to um, now that I'm doing the. Um, the third round going over those those uh, codings, we may be able to at least introduce that. Um, that I think that would help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and Matias, okay. this is a citation, right? Yeah, I got it. All right. Uh, and if uh if no questions, uh then yeah, thank you for uh attending this seminar. Thank you. Uh thanks uh Paris for presenting this great paper. So yeah. These were great comments by the way. Yeah, these are really helpful. This is really okay. helpful and uh, a lot of work for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hope uh, we can see this paper published in a very good journal in the near future. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So have a nice day. Thank you.